think California has a key role in being the beacon of hope for the rest of the country. I mean, we actually continue to make progress here and the progress that we've made is picked up in other states. If you look at the LGBT movement is the one that I'm most familiar with and the environmental movement, so the two areas that I've focused on mm. the most. I mean, California, we have the strongest laws right. of any state in the country in both of those areas, and they tend to be a model for what's happening in other states, but we still have a lot of work to do. All right. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. I'm your host, Jarrett Blonin. Today, we are joined by Assemblyman Rick Chavez Zabur of Assembly District 51. Rick, thanks for joining us. How's it going? You're welcome. Good, good. Just got back from break. Nice to be back in Sacramento. Yeah, you look tan and rested, ready to go for this uh, 30-day uh, sprint to the end. Yeah. Uh, kind of, you know, what, what's it looking like for your kind of end of session? This is your first end of session, This right? is my first end of session, so it's the first time I'll experience the very end of session. Right. The ultimate suspense coming up. Ultimate so, yeah, suspense. A lot, of, yeah. a lot of fun coming up. Yeah. Uh, you know, for our listeners who who don't know a lot about you, including me, like I remember you were Mr. Equality California. Yep. And we just had like the top 100 out for the Capital Weekly. And you've always been featured of that uh, top 100 as, as Mr. Equality California. So, uh, you know, what did you do prior to Equality California and kind of, you know, what brought you here to the assembly finally? Well, before that, I was a lawyer at a big law firm, Latham and Watkins in Los Angeles. I okay. was the first openly gay partner there, first openly gay wow. lawyer. Um, practice in the clean energy and environmental law space. Okay. Um, and so, um, and was, um, before I got to Quality California, in terms of my community service, was very involved in the environmental movement. So had uh, served as, um, on the, I've been on the board of the California Environmental Voters for 20 something years and served as president of that organization for almost seven years um, prior to going to Equality California. Wow. Uh, but I, th then I was, you know, a lawyer in my day job and basically. Uh, so you went, where'd you go to law school? I went to Harvard, Harvard okay. and Yale undergrad. It's a pretty good school, I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's good. It was, so I was, a, it was, you know, I'm not from a family that that's actually pretty typical. I right. grew up on a really small, in a very small farm community south of Albuquerque, very Latino, okay, relatively Mexico, poor yeah. farm community in New Mexico, a little town called Los Lunas. Uh, Los uh, Luna it would usually be Los Lunas if you're talking about the moons, but mm. it's Los Lunas because it was uh, it was named after the Luna family. Right. Um, and my my my, you know, I'm part of the Chavez family, the large family that settled in central New Mexico in the 1500s. Um, wow. So it's uh, yeah, it's that's you know that that's the, the heritage on my mom's side. Right. And so then you know, I, I guess you just you know did well in high school there in Albuquerque and, and made your way to Yale. Yeah, you know, it's it was a really small farm community. Um, you know, the academics were actually pretty poor in the school. And my dad was someone who had been a high school dropout. He, on the Czech side, it was in a, a family that, you know, was very poor. And he dropped out of high school when he was, I think, 16 years old to help support mm -hmm. his family and went to work in the steel mills. And then went back, uh, served in the Air Force during the Korean War, and because of the opportunities given to him by the GI Bill, he actually went back and got his high school diploma, got his college degree, he got a PhD, and he wow. was like a big education advocate. Right. So he always told all of us, like, you need to go to school, you need to do well in school. Mm -hmm. That's like the opportunity to success. Right. And um, so I ended up, you know, graduating first in my class in, in this little farm town. Um, I think back then I knew that I was probably, I wasn't willing to accept it in a, um, in a, you know, in, in a way that was, um, you know, that I was sort of cognizant of it. But I think deep down inside, I knew that I was right. a gay person and the the town was really backward when it came to that. There weren't people that were out. People were taunted if they, you know, were viewed as being effeminate or were suspected of it. And so there was a part of me that I felt like I needed to like leave that kind of community. And that's when I, um, that, what I actually wanted to do is I wanted to go to Pomona college out here because I got a brochure that showed all these kids like Sunshine. wrapping yeah. under these palm trees. And I actually thought it was basically right on the, on the Pacific ocean right. and not realizing that it was like two hours inland. Um, so I decided I wanted to go to Pomona college and they didn't even, um, they didn't even administer the SAT in my high school because it was no one went to college. So I had to like travel all the way to Albuquerque to take the SAT. And when I, um, when I, um, uh, when I did that, I scored very well. Um, and 
uh, another little factoid is um, in preparation for taking the SAT, my high school guidance counselor um, suggested that I take the service academy exam as a prep for it because we didn't have like prep courses. Right. So this is a poor town, you know, didn't like have people that helped you get into school, right? And so I just had a guidance counselor. You say, couldn't bribe anyone back then. For the there SAT? wasn't, and no yeah. one, no one went, you know. So there wasn't, there weren't people. There were, you know, like my kids now, like they're in South Pasadena, right. and there's, there's this whole you know, this whole industry of people coaching kids to right. like get into school. Yeah. I mean, it was sort of like I had a, like a guidance counselor in a public school who said, you know, maybe you should take this other test as practice. And I did that. Um, and that test I scored so high in that I got an appointment to West Point. And when that happened, I knew that that probably wasn't a good thing for me and decided that I needed to get in some place that was viewed as better because it was all over the papers in this little farm town that right. I had gotten this West Point nomination. And that's when I decided to apply to Harvard and Yale. And that, luckily, because I was from this little town out in the middle of nowhere that right. anyone knew, you know, I was sort of this sort of diversity candidate, you know, mm -hmm. it was like, it was like the, the small town farm kid right. <laughs> that was going, that got so admitted like, to Yale. That's funny. So like Oppenheimer's just come out yeah, and it, it, you know, a lot of it takes place in, in New, New Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. yeah. So how far was that from where you grew up? Uh, not too far. Yeah. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, when I was at Yale, one of my, history thesis was about actually um, the uh, I, I did sort of an oral history of people that were still in New Mexico that actually worked on the Manhattan Project there mm. in Los Alamos. Right. And my grandfather actually was alive when they actually um, did the, 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 the test bomb at White Sands. And I remember him telling me as a kid that he had seen what was up that morning and could see like the lights flashing. Right. And then I did this, all this research in the papers in New Mexico and, you know, looked at how it was reported. It was reported in all the, New, all the New Mexico papers in Albuquerque and Santa Fe and all mm -hmm. these little towns all around it as a munitions dump explosion that the, oh, really? that oh. the, that the military had, right. they had an accidental thing. It wasn't, mm -hmm. wasn't reported about what it was. Right. Um, and so a lot of the paper that I did was what did the people in New Mexico actually think was happening when, you know, all these people were coming into Los Alamos and, you know, there was this, this big city that was like secret built like north of Santa Fe, mm -hmm. right? Um, so. Conspiracies in New Mexico. Yeah. There, there, right. I mean, there wasn't that many. Roswell. Much, what, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's probably why Roswell <laughs> happened in the end. <laughs> that's funny. Because the things that, that, because there was a conspiracy, right. there was something happening that was right. being, that was that people were being lied to about. That's funny. So like, you know, Harvard and Yale, there's a bunch of, you know, fellow alums there in the legislature, yes. uh, very famous alums. Any any famous folks you, you went to law school or undergrad with? Uh, well, Tom Steyer is probably the most successful in my class, um, you know, who runs Next Gen yep. and, yeah, and a good friend and was a good, strong supporter of Equality California when I first came in. Uh, we were struggling and he was someone that I went to to help for help. Um, Mike Fuhrer, who was a member of the legislature right. uh, before me and is uh, and was then most recently L.A. City attorney, was in my class. So I've known him. We were actually seatmates my first year in, at Harvard Law School. So we've known each other for a lot of years. Um, yeah, but yeah. What's that That's famous it. like law school movie? That takes place at Harvard. Paper Law. Chase. Yeah, Paper Chase. Yeah. yeah. Was it? Was it like that? It is like that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, it's yeah. very competitive. Um, I didn't. I don't think I. I went to Yale undergrad, and like I have a lot closer friendships there, and more affinity to mm -hmm. to Yale than I do to Harvard because it's just like a very competitive place. Um, you know, you're just sort of thrown in, and it's yeah, it's all about the competition and who does well. You know, who sinks or and swim, who swims. Yeah. yeah. So then you know you graduate law school and you come out west. What brought you out to California? Well, I first um, worked for a consulting firm because I wanted to um, just learn more about business. And then went to work for a company called Bain and Company, which was the same firm that Mitt Romney was at. And he was actually my boss for, for a year after I got out. So I was in his group sort of doing management consulting. And then in LA? No, in Boston. Okay, but right. yeah, I stayed he's from in Boston. Boston right? yeah, yeah, I stayed in Boston for a year. Right. And then I wanted to get closer to my family, uh, which was in New Mexico. And it was just, you know, it was a whole day to get back and forth. And there wasn't real opportunities in New Mexico. I mean, I thought about going back and practicing law there. But, you know, I was just coming out as a gay man and I just couldn't see myself. I mean, New Mexico was just really not a... What year is this? This is now, would be a 1983, 84. Okay. Yeah. And I, I ended up in LA in 85. Um, so I worked for a year in Boston and then came from Boston to Los Angeles. And that's, and, and it got hired right away with Latham and Watkins, right. which was one of the major firms in town. And so, you know, it, it's pretty interesting. It seemed like we've made a lot of strides in the mm -hmm. kind of the gay movement the LGBTQ movement. Um, but like in 1985, like 
But what there was, was that like? There was out? no one out. In I mean, the there 80s. was no one out in most right. of the major firms. I mean, like when I got there, um, you know, and my friend, I mean, I had a group of gay friends. I had a lot of folks that from law school and college that didn't know I was gay. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. I le- led a pretty closeted life with a group of gay friends. Um, and when I went to the, to, to Latham, you know, looked around, there was no one that was openly gay at the firm, no openly gay partners, no openly gay associates. And so it was just like, it was sort of the norm. Everyone just assumed you were straight and that was, and you sort of hit it. And, um, you know, and that sort of was pretty much the case everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think it was really for me, uh, I became more active because of the AIDS crisis. I mean, I'm in that generation where, you know, think about it, you know, the first cases of AIDS right. emerged around 1980. I'm graduating in 1983. It's starting to become an epidemic. I go to Latham, you know, people in my, in my peer groups are getting sick and starting to die. A lot of the people in my, that were gay in my Yale and Harvard classes were sick. Um, and I, you know, you didn't, they didn't have tests at that time. And so there was all this fear all over the place. Um, and so, um, at that point, uh, Probably, uh, I had a I had a boyfriend here who then, right as the tests came out, uh, got tested and he tested positive. Wow! And um, and I thought that I was probably positive too, but didn't want to get tested because it would have limited my ability. And you know, we didn't have the Affordable Care Act. I, mm. you know, I wouldn't be able to get health insurance. I wouldn't be able to get life insurance. Right. If I got tested, I'd either have to lie about that. So for me, I didn't want to get tested. Um, and and then, but assumed that I had it and was living in a way that comported with that. Um, and then my, you know, my boyfriend and I just became very active in the AIDS movement. I mean, it was really, you know, the government was doing anything. I was, you know, the reason I became politically active in California was I was trying to help people get elected that would actually do something about right. AIDS, fund AIDS research, try to make sure that there was a public health response. Um, I think the first person I actively supported was Barbara Boxer. I, I did a fundraiser for her. It was supposed to be a house party. Um, in the LGBTQ community, and it was just a group of friends of mine and I, and basically what was supposed to be like a twenty or thirty person small dollar event turned into like eight or nine hundred people. We had to move to the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. It was like the first wow. LGBTQ fundraiser right. for a Senate candidate any place in the country, um, and that's how I got to you know became close to, to Senator Boxer and. Um, and then you know helped Richard Katz uh, when he was running for mayor because he was so positive on LGBTQ mm-hmm. issues at a time when most people weren't right. Right, um, uh, right around that time, Sheila Kuehl got elected for the first time. I mean, that was um, the you know she was the first you know elected official LGBTQ elected official in the state. Um, and so then you know I but, but I had never really um, and and then you know I ended up uh, in nineteen um, ninety five. Decided to run for Congress in the in the seat that I was um, living in, which was Long Beach, um, and you know I was just this idealistic kid that didn't sort of. I was How old very, were you? Then? I was I was in my thirties in my mid thirties, yeah. 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 And, um, but didn't, you know, I was like running against a sitting Republican incumbent. I just thought I could take him out because yeah, he was Long bad. Beach was conservative, right? That was like, it was really, yeah. Yeah. Territory. I mean, it was, docks, well, it was, right? it was the most democratic seat held by a Republican. So it was very purple, mm-hmm. but I'm running against like a moderate Republican right. who had been like head of the Cal state Long Beach. who was like beloved. And I'm like this kid, this Democrat is like, he's voting to cut, like not doing anything for AIDS. He's voting to cut all the environmental stuff. Remember this is the contract with America years. Right. right. Um, and so he's voting to cut Medicare and food stamps and environmental protections and all of that. And I was like, you know, this is my congressman. This guy sucks. You know, I'm going to, no one's going to, and the guy that had challenged him the time before was so, uh, our views were not all that different on most things, but he presented as very far left. And mm-hmm. this was a very purple district. And so I knew he couldn't win. And so decided just to run. Um, and end up beating him. He stayed in the race. I beat the party nominee the cycle before, raised a lot of money, um, ended up speaking at the national convention. I got to the point where this was, you know, even though it was not on any of the targets by the time the general election came about, it was, you know, one of the targeted races and got a lot of national attention and then didn't, didn't, wasn't able to right. get through. Yeah. So, so that's crazy. So your boyfriend in, in, had 
AIDS or positive with HIV. It was, it was HIV positive. He's HIV never, positive. he's never emerged since. Yeah. And he's still alive That's today. Amazing. He's, wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, we're not, we're not, we're never, not together you never anymore. You got tested. You were like. No, I had, I did get did tested finally, after that. Fine. I finally got yeah. tested. I was negative. I mean, there's some weird, wow. you know, I don't know if it's just luck or it was just, yeah. I, mean, I think some doctors think some people have right. some, some kind of natural immunity. The Magic Johnson. It. Yeah. Just miracle. Yeah. Na- natural wow. immunity. But uh, yes, I've never been, but, it, but, you know, it sort of, it was the, it continues to be one of the reasons why I became involved politically because of sort of the need to, you know, the reason why government did not have a real response to that public health epidemic was because it affected primarily gay men and, Mm -hmm. you know, and the government didn't care about them generally. And we ended up having to build a political movement to cause government to, you know, to exert some political power to cause government to start paying attention to the needs of the community. And, you know, to that, that continues yeah. today in many ways. Interesting. So, you know, you were in a Beverly Hills law firm. Yeah, in, downtown LA. Downtown LA yeah. in, in the nineties. Yeah. Um, OJ Simpson happens. Mm-hmm. Um, that was when I was running. Actually. And I, yeah. I love, yeah. I love the books about OJ read about Shapiro uh-huh. and Johnny Cochran down at the restaurants, having lunch all the time. Were you part of that scene? Were you having lunch? Were you seeing these guys at lunch? No. I, so, I, so Latham is a big corporate law firm. It's probably now I think it may be the Bay largest U.S.-based law firm. It wasn't at, at the time I was there, the two larger firms in town. But it was it's one of those white shoe yeah. corporate firms that actually has, you know, a banking practice and a litigation practice right. and a, oh, yeah, I mean, a rental yeah. group and all of that. So it's a little bit different than sort of the trial lawyers, these, you know, the the really high profile right. fancy trial lawyers that you sort of see representing folks in these major cases. So, so you were up in the 50th floor. Of I was up, rise. yeah, doing like toiling away, writing, <laughs> just, writing briefs, just writing, and, yeah, yeah. writing briefs you know, and, yeah, and going huh? to court yeah. when I was there. I, I, t- I tended to, I ended up not being a litigator. I was mm. more of a, um, an, an, an envi- well, I was an environmental lawyer and did a, sort of had a more of an administrative practice uh-huh. and practice before government agencies to try to, um, in the end, try to get, clean energy projects approved. So. Okay. So yeah, I remember um, when I went to law school, I took environmental law and mm-hmm. I was like, that's what I wanted. That sounds awesome. Yeah. And then I interned for an environmental law firm and all they did was asbestos cases. And I was yeah. like, is this what environmental law is? Well, in some, in some places it is. That's not everything. My, <laughs> yeah, my, like, my oh, practice man, was, yeah. yeah, I mean, environmental law is a lot of things. Mm-hmm. It's defending people on asbestos cases. I didn't right. do that. I was a, I was a, not a litigator. Um, I mean, I, most of what I was doing was trying to help, um, companies in the clean energy space to trying to get, you know, solar projects approved in the latter years and, um, wind energy projects approved and taking, um, uh, things through CEQA, um, wow. and, um, did a lot of work for, you know, the public utilities, um, across the state and. That's awesome. Stuff you can use today, right? Now yeah, well, it's, really it's, it's part it. of one, it's one of my major bills right. is I think is, you know, is guided by the fact that I think, you know, I've got a lot of expertise from um, understanding how complicated, um, complicated projects, uh, you know, um, how, what, what some of the challenges are about right. getting them approved and, you know, and approving projects that basically protect our environment, but also make sure that the public has the, um, That's the, the frustrating kind of thing with environmental needs. law. So uh, finally, I made it to the attorney general's office, and yeah. I worked in the environmental law section. Oh, for did a while, you? Yeah. And then I learned, wait a second, environmental law is is often abused mm-hmm. to not protect the environment, to, but to protect you know certain special interests from doing projects that you know might be good and helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of like this shield and a sword uh, yeah. Uh, often. And so yeah, it's, it's frustrating because there's a lot of these projects that we want to do that will be good for the environment in the long term, but are being stalled by people who don't want them using kind of these environmental protection laws. And I guess that's something the governor brought up this year, right? So, you know, he did. He we did. He's trying to see. And we, do, and, and stuff, we right? do need to streamline. And I think really the challenge is how do we streamline in a way that actually protects the environment, right? right. I mean, um, you know, there were some bills already that came up this year that I was sort of in the hot seat on related to some of the housing bills. And, um, and, you know, some of the questions, I mean, I'm someone who agrees we need to do everything we can to build housing as quickly as possible. Addressing, you know, addressing the crisis of homelessness that we're facing is something that requires us to build a lot more housing right. as well as building a lot more transition housing and, and, and providing more mental health and substance use services. There's a whole bunch of things we need to be doing, but housing is one of them. But when you're doing that housing, you can't just basically say, okay, we're just going to do the housing and ignore the fact that 
you know, we don't want housing on sensitive habitat. We don't want housing um, in wetlands areas. We don't want housing that's going to sort of block the whole coastline and basically not allow the public to have access to our beaches. So, you know, one of the issues was, you know, how much do we um, change the responsibility for the coastal right, commission right, right, right. on one of these housing bills? And I was someone who was in that camp that I both wanted to protect the coast and wanted to advance housing. So I became one of the focal points in one of these bills with people lobbying me on both sides. And actually, I felt like I did a good job trying to make sure that we improved the bill and, but, and ultimately mm -hmm. voted for it, but improved the bill so that, um, so that the coast was protected right. despite that. But, you know, those are, they're always hard questions right. and the devil's always in the details yeah. when you're talking about reform. So, you know, you've spent your life as an advocate, right, uh, as an attorney and working with Equality California. What is it like being on the other side, being lobbied on the other side? And, and you know, how, how is lobbying work with you? Uh, so, one, I talk to everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, um, I think that, um, you know, the important thing is to always make decisions that are in the best interest of the California public, but um, that doing that means you know, hearing everyone out and trying to make policy and law that, um, you know, as much as you can, that does no harm. And so often the devil is in the details and often you can achieve an objective in a way that achieves the objective and hurts some people. And sometimes you, or hurts, and sometimes hurts a lot of people and mm -hmm. sometimes achieves the objectives and hurts less people or hurts no one. Right. And you obviously want those latter approaches. Right. So, um, I tend to be, you know, I, I take a lot of meetings. I take a lot of meetings with, you know, I always make sure that I've talked to both sides or the multiple sides. Sometimes there's four or five sides on right. an issue on a bill, right? Um, and, you know, just try to do my best to, you know, always keep the public's interest at the forefront of my decision making. Um, and, but, you know, I think the one thing I'll say is um, what, I've, what I've been surprised about is just the volume of, information that you need to absorb um and really grapple with right. um you know sometimes we're making decisions that are really have sort of very significant monumental consequences to a community or to an industry or to um you know a, a, you know the environment or you know some goal that we have but we're doing it with very little information. Right. You know, sometimes we've got or a staff in a quick time frame, right? In a yeah. very quick time frame. I mean, at the end of session, I was like having to get through two and three hundred bills in one night, and so I would be—I literally was up reading till two and three in the morning. I read every single staff report. I read it's like almost every again, letter. Right? It was. <laughs> I was going through. I, I I had ways where I had sort of figured out how to you know to to cut through some of them in the end, so that I got a sense of you know what the key issues were and, you know, would come back a lot of times and ask for more information, but it's like, it's a lot, it's, you know, over 2000 bills you have to grapple with. That's a lot of information. Uh, but yeah. it's also one of the exciting things about this place. I mean, you get to learn a lot about things you had no idea right. that you're doing, but, um, but it's, it's different than, for example, a regulatory agency where, you know, some of the decisions you would make in a regulatory agency when the, when the legislature steps in, we're doing this with, basically a six or seven page staff report with a very limited, you know, these are the arguments that one side is making. These are right. what the opponents are saying. This is a list of who supports and opposes it. And then you're making some big decision in a regulatory agency for the same adopting a rule would often be two and 300 pages of analysis. Right. 45 right? Days. Yeah. Comment so I'd look period, at this. I'm yeah. like, seriously, um, I have to make a decision based on this six pages of information. Like, you know, I'd have like 17 questions and I'd mm -hmm. have my staff going back, trying right. to track stuff down before I had to make a decision. That's funny. So, you know, how long did you run a quality California for? Uh, almost eight years. And you, you know, you did a great job of really, you know, bringing it to the forefront, uh, doing the awards and all that stuff. At what point did you say like, Hey, I want to, I want to run for assembly. So, um, when I went to quality California, I had, been talking to folks in Governor Brown's office about coming into his administration. Well, this is why I was at Latham uh, before I'd gone there um, after he was reelected. And so I wanted to do, you know, and I, I'd worked for Tom Harkin for a, 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 about a year before I went into between Yale and Harvard mm -hmm. in law school and always thought that I would do something in public service. My you could have been a judge. I mean, yeah. the judge is not quite my personality. It's a little bit, I think I'm too much of an activist to be right. a judge, you know, yeah. where you have to sit quietly. And, right. um, but, uh, but my, but you know, my dad was very politically active. He never ran for anything. I was always his sidekick. I always thought that it was really interesting. 
you know, I always thought it was like really the way that if you wanted to like, you know, change things in the world, that mm-hmm. was the, that's the best way of doing right. it. Right. Um, and then when I came out as a gay man, I just, real, I, I believed at the time that that just wasn't in the cards for me. I mean, there weren't elected officials that were gay or people that were even out in appointed roles. Right. So I just said, okay, that's not going to happen. I'm just going to practice law and then got pulled back into it through all the AIDS crisis stuff. And then eventually, then I ran the first time and lost um, and then got very active in the environmental movement. And for 20 years, then I just practiced law and was really doing a lot of stuff through California environmental voters um, and Lambda Legal and some other major nonprofits. Um, and so um, so anyway, Governor Brown, I, you know, I, I, mean, I talked to him about coming into his administration in a senior role. I told Latham that I was going to take an early retirement so I could do that. And then the executive director of Equality California sort of up and quit right in the middle of that. And they came to me and asked if I would take over the organization. Um, I originally declined it because I wanted to do something in government service, mm-hmm. um, but then realized that they were having such significant financial issues because of just the timing and coming out of Prop 8 and the controversy around the organization at the time that they were very, very fragile and that if I didn't take over that they didn't have time to find someone else frankly and so I agreed to do it for a year that turned into eight turned into really the most rewarding job I've ever had I mean then Trump was elected right after I came in there and just realized that we just had a big fight on our hands and they needed good help and um and so that was happening and then I had a sister who became ill with ALS um and um in 20 this would have been when was it like the 2020 so in 2020 she it was a, probably about um, nine months before she passed away from ALS she she came to me on one of these you know we had a number of heart to hearts during that period of time and she said you know Rick you know you were supposed to do something in public service you keep things keep happening where you put that aside mm-hmm. and she said please promise me that you're going to do something you know you're in your 60s it's not too it's not, you know, you may think it's right. too late in your career to do something, but you should just do it. And so I thought about that and I thought, you know, it is something I really want to try before, you know, before the end of my career. And Equality California was in a very strong position. I felt that we had taken the organization. I think we had quadrupled it in size and we had a strong budget and, you know, we had really made a mark for the organization mm-hmm. again, put it back on the map. And felt that the both the board and the staff was in a position where it could withstand a transition. And so um, the first decided to run for city attorney because I looked around and the only open seat that was up was the L.A. city attorney seat. And so announced for that. Um, and then a few months after announcing for that, uh, former assembly member Richard Bloom announced that he was going to run for the board of supervisors. And I was in that district. I looked at that and I thought, you know, that's just a better fit for me. It may be a little bit right. not quite as high profile in the sense it's not a, you know, LA city wide seat, but given what I want to do, which is really, you know, advance, um, you know, address the, the crisis of climate change and, um, focus on LGBTQ civil rights and social rights generally and environmental protection and addressing our housing crisis and our homeless crisis. This is way better than sort of a, yeah. you know, than a job where I'm advising the city on mm. things as important as that is. I'm not, you Especially know. all the drama going on. Yeah, there. yeah. And then, then after that, then a lot yeah. of other stuff happened in LA, and I thought, right. God, I really made a good decision. Yeah. Gee. <laughs> yeah. Gee whiz. Um, so, like LGBTQ rights, like you're right, like amazing strides were made from, you know, the 80s, 90s. Mm-hmm. Prop 8 kind of happens, and we we're like, oh, that's kind of weird. Yeah. But then amazing strides happen again, right? Like yeah. right now, you poll, and, you know, we're working on overturning, you know, that language in Prop 8. Yeah. But, you know, a couple of years ago, I remember Evan Lowe ran a bill. That said, you know, if you went to a, another state and they had these kind of anti LGBTQ laws, like you can't, no state funded travel. And back then, there was like, it was like a shock that a state would do something like yeah. that. And well, I was out of Quality California yeah. and we were one of the, we were the bill sponsor right. for that. And we actually went to like, Evan for yeah. that bill and suggested that he do it. And there was like a national championship game or something like that. Yeah. Sponsors were pulling funding and it was yeah. a big deal, right? It was a big like, deal. We're not going to fund a, a, a hate state, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or a hate community. We're not, you travel to a right. hate state, yeah. And now, well, now it's like this, every state's on the ban, on the I ban know, list. Yeah, and we're and we're fixing that this year. So it's, right. uh, the pro tem uh, Atkins has a a bill where we're going to sort of you know it's it's now at a point where it's I think it was the right thing to do to sort of slow some of this mm-hmm. thing some of these things down. You know, whenever we passed it six or seven right. eight years ago, now all it's really doing is I think it's impeding um, impeding uh, you know. 
it's so broad that it's, it's impeding things that I think are good things to, in terms of traveling to some of these states and, you know, the, the, the bill that, uh, the, the pro tem is authoring, I support and, you know, that that's going to be modified and, um, is supposed to be sort of transformed into some sort of an education but program. In some I, yeah, I guess something that was kind of like an anomaly, like yeah. having these like hate states is now the norm. Like we have like, you know, I guess hate is prevalent now. Kind of what's, what's going on? Like what, what's the mood shift? And you know, why, well, it's, it's, why it's, are we kind of relapsing after we've made so much progress? It's, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's what's going on in the national landscape generally with the, uh, you know, with the rise of the MAGA movement and, um, the division that's happening in the country. And, you know, the reality is that the Republicans have, through voter suppression and gerrymandering, have actually taken control of enough state governments in other states that they're able to pass things that a majority of the public, even in those states, don't really support. And it's happened enough that, you know, it's um, um, that a, min a minority of the country is basically driving policy in a bunch of these states. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really need to continue pushing back. We need to be vigilant. We need to make sure that, um, that, you know, the Republicans don't, don't take control of the presidency right. and that we take really, if we want to make forward progress, that we basically take back control of both houses of Congress um, and start focusing on things like adopting voting rights. I mean, we can't, you know, we can't allow um, the, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't comport with the values of democracy to have minorities controlling many of these states, which is a, in fact what's happening. Right. So, you know, I guess like, you know, I, as you were kind of like seeing kind of like this kind of like backtracking kind of like what, what can be done to kind of like promote kind of this more inclusive society that it seemed like we were on, you know, we were progressing so well. There for well, I think California has a key role in mm -hmm. being the beacon of hope for the rest of the country. I mean, we actually continue to make progress here and the progress that we've made is picked up in other states. Um, so, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the LGBT uh, movement is the one that I'm most familiar with and the environmental movement. So the two areas that I focused on mm. the most, I mean, California, we have the, we have the strongest laws right. of any state in the country in both of those areas. And they tend to be a model for what's happening in other states, but we still have a lot of work to do. I mean, right. it's, you know, I, I've got a bill this year, AB five, which is, <gasps> you know, the subject of a lot of the controversy right. in some of these things. I mean, that bill has been so mischaracterized by some of these, um, some of these MAGA folks, mm -hmm. Uh, and then I think they know they're, and some, some of them, some of them know they're doing it. Other ones, I think just, you know, I, I don't know what the, you know, I, I've, I've been surprised about how much of our dialogue is not fact-based, but you know, the law is basically one that all it really does is requires that school districts give teachers the training to understand how to identify at-risk LGBTQ youth who are being bullied in their schools or facing lack of acceptance in the community or even lack of acceptance in their own homes mm -hmm. and helping them understand how to respond and get them to the right resources, um, how to make sure that our schools are safe and supportive, that kids aren't being bullied, the teachers understand like when it's appropriate to intervene, right. not allow sort of hate speech happening on the playgrounds or in the hallways of the school. Um, and that has been characterized in ways that are just crazy as you might ever think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I remember when, like, when I was in high school, like the hate speech, uh, gay hate speech was off the charts. And like, you could even say it on TV. Oh, well, it still and, happens. <laughs> it still happens. And, uh, yeah. Now it's, it's been t totally eradicated. Yeah. Oh, uh, so uh, no, no, not so much. I mean, it's still, that's the reason, part of the reason why this bill is out yeah. there. I mean, I've had my, had my own kids because they actually have LGBTQ parents. I mean. I can't tell you the number of things that have happened in the schools where, you know, because teachers didn't have the training that they needed, that just sort of things sort of went by and it's, you know, has long-term impacts in terms of school climate. Um, one example was when my daughter was in middle school, she opens her textbook up to the day that they had, to the pages that they had been on the day before and overnight uh, appeared in her textbook in Mark, in Sharpie, the words kill all the effing and then another derogatory mm -hmm. word for gay people um, wasn't wasn't an accident. I think that it was in her book. Right. Right. And so she takes it to the teacher. The teacher sort of just sort of sloughs it off. She comes home that night, tells me what happened. I said, well, you know, was the teacher teaching school? Maybe he didn't even realize what it said. And so she sends him this email that night and said, you know, I don't know if you saw what I pointed out to you in school today, but it said these bad words because you know i know kids use bad words but you know this is like hate speech and yeah. you know i don't 
you know, I'm happy to use my allowance to pay for another bill or book or share with someone else. Um, he, he emails her back that night and says, you know, come see me in the afternoon. I'm thinking, okay, well, every, this is taken care of. He just was busy and sort of overlooked, you know, how he should have responded. She comes into the room and he basically opens the drawer, hands her a bottle of white out and says, you're making a big deal out of nothing. Well, that's not the way you handle those things. And frankly, you know, luckily she had parents that provide the support that she right. needed for it. But some kids don't. And that give you, and frankly, and he, she had a good teacher. I mean, it was a teacher that we liked. He's not a homophobe. Mm. I mean, this is about teachers just not having, being given the tools that they need and the training that they want. And, you know, one thing that I'm really proud about AB5 is that, you know, the teachers unions are our strongest supporters. They're sponsors of this bill. You know, this is right. something that the school districts are not giving them. And they want that, you know, when they have sort of a, Another situation I had with my daughter, again, when she was, I think, in fifth grade, there was a family that um, found out that she had gay parents and basically told this little girl that she couldn't be friends with my daughter anymore. And so a few weeks later, they were having a birthday party for the little girl and decided to um, hand out invitations to the birthday party in the classroom through the school and invited every kid except for my daughter. And my daughter came home crying wow. that night. And so we went to the school the next day. And basically said, and the teacher said, you know, I just didn't know what to do. You know, there are best practices for those things. You know, yeah. the best practice is if you're going to basically do something that's out of school that every kid gets invited or you don't, you right. know, it's not allowed. Right. But schools are not, these are the kinds of things that would be covered in these kinds of, um, in these, in this kind of training and that the teachers want, you know, she had a great teacher. We loved the teacher. She right. loved her kids and she, you know, she's, they're facing these situations, but if people haven't been given those tools, and are you know you're not thinking about right. them ahead of time and preparing for the things that are likely to happen, then you know you end up having school environments that are not as um, conducive as they should be. And we know it's a problem because LGBTQ kids are dropping out of school at a rate that's four times other kids. So it's not like we're making you know that this is just uh, you know minor minor minor, issue, minor, yeah. minor issues that you know that we shouldn't be paying attention to, and that people just need to buck up and be you know, have a better backbone. Well, you know, it's, it's, um, the, the examples I'm, um, uh, raising are ones that may be more minor, but you know, when you actually have a, uh, a whole environment where that's happening a lot, or when kids are basically calling people names, mm -hmm. you know, with certain derogatory, whether they be homophobic or transphobic or racist or anything else, and you actually have teachers and school administrators that are not intervening and actually setting a tone then, you know, that results in kids basically feeling ostracized and alone and targeted. Right. And, you know, we need to we need to stop that to help them stay in school. Definitely. So, you know, 8051, what what can you tell us a little bit about, about your district and kind of the cities in there? Yeah, so it's a great district. Um, it starts uh, some people call it the Route 66 district because it's about a mile uh, north and south of Santa Monica Boulevard, which is the old Route 66. Okay. But it sort of starts in Los Feliz. I've got a little bit of Los Feliz, mm -hmm. and then I go over the hill into the valley, and I pick up Universal City and Universal Studios, and a little bit of I go all the way over to Warner Brothers and like Forest Lawn Cemetery, and then most of the rest of the district is on the LA side of the LA Mountains. And so Los Feliz, um, I've got Larchmont Village and Hancock Park, all of Hollywood, all of West Hollywood. I've got Hollywood Hills, sort of south of Mulholland. I go down into the mid Wilshire area, down to about Olympic. Then I keep running west. Uh, in addition to West Hollywood, I've got Beverly Hills. I've got UCLA and Westwood. Wow. Uh, west, a lot of West LA, Rancho Park, uh, Cheviot Hills, and then all of Santa Monica. So it's a, it's an incredibly, um, it's a incredibly important district. We've got some of the best yeah. hospitals in the state, both UCLA Medical Center and Cedar Sinai and Children's Hospital. Um, we've got the, many of the major movie studios, uh, Paramount and Universal right. and um, Netflix and Sunset Gallery right. Studios. Um, so you have like some of the best places in the state yeah. to live. Yeah. And everybody would love to live there. And what I've noticed is I've actually started like looking at homes there because anytime I'm down there, I'm like, oh, how much is a home here? Yeah. And like in 2019, you'd look at a home there and be like one, two million bucks. Now that same home is like. Eight million dollars <laughs> in some places. In, in some places, yeah. yeah. So, like, my yeah. neighborhood isn't an eight million dollars, right, 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 right? But um, and we've you, got and we've got some neighborhoods that are actually relatively poor, especially in in Hollywood, in certain parts of the district. Yeah. Um, we were, you know, a lot of West Hollywood got a right. lot of renters, a lot of low income folks. 
But yeah, that's kind of like but, that, like housing affordability, right? Something yeah. that you talked about. Like what, what can be done to kind of address housing affordability kind of in these places where people want to live? Because, you know, everyone can't commute from, right. you know, the valley or the desert to come in to these places. Well, we need to build more housing. Yeah. And I think one of the things I think we need to do is we need to build more. We Our strategy needs to have more of a Southern California um, understanding the land use patterns of Southern California mm-hmm. needs to be tailored to Los Angeles, the Los Angeles areas. A lot of these housing bills that um, have passed have passed without the support of many of the legislators in Los Angeles County. Yeah, they mainly Bay Area driven, right? It's yeah. really Bay Area driven. There's a lot of opposition. In my district, there's a lot of controversy about this, both because we've got strong advocates to build more housing, and then we've got very strong advocates for people in neighborhoods that basically feel like the integrity of single family neighborhoods is being um, and of local control is being um, jeopardized right. by some of these bills. And, you know, the bottom line is, um, you know, when I was running for office, I, you know, went to all the neighborhood associations. I met with the pro housing people with the environmental groups. And there is consensus in my district. It's just that, you know, it's it, it's hard to uh, it requires very sophisticated strategies um on some of these things but it's really putting housing really along the transit corridors and really along the key streets Mm. um a transit corridor in northern california and san francisco is a different than a transit corridor in la because a transit corridor in la a lot the formulation has been that you basically provide incentives you ease restrictions you streamline anything that's within a half a mile of a transit corridor well, if you think about the transit corridors in LA are primarily buses. We do have rail, but they're primarily buses. But the transit corridors, when there's when they're defined as Sunset Boulevard and Santa Monica Boulevard, and right. you know all the all the the east west lines that have bus routes and the north south ones that have bus routes, and then you start going a half mile in, they meet in every place. So what you've done is you've undone the zoning for the whole city all the way across the city. I mean that's that's the difference between what some of these housing bills have done that are coming out of Northern California. Uh, you know, I've told some of the advocates, I said, you look at, um, when I go to neighborhood associations and I say, look at, um, let's put housing that's four, five, six story housing on Santa Monica Boulevard itself, not intruding too far into the neighborhood. Let's put neighborhood serving retail, like, you know, Starbucks and Trader Joe's right. and Whole Foods on the ground level and put the housing above it, both apartments. There's not that there's some, right. but there's not that much opposition. In fact, it makes, mo- sense, yeah. it makes sense. People say, Oh yeah, I'd like that. I'd be right. able to walk down and, you know, and have things that I'd want to use on these more vibrant corridors with housing above them. But when you're talking about something that then allows a developer to sort of come in and raise a bunch of houses in a single family neighborhood and put a big apartment building in, that's where you actually have opposition. And I think there's validity to that perspective. If right. someone is buying a single family house in a single family neighborhood, they should be, have some amount of ability to at least go to their local elected officials before something changes in their neighborhood. Right. So, you know, I know you're on a, a tight schedule here, you know, you gotta get back to the legislature, yep. but kind of just wrapping up this session, kind of next 30 days, kind of what, what are you looking to accomplish and kind of what do you have on suspense and kind of how's your bill package looking, you know, get to the governor's desk here. Well, I've got AB5, which is my safe and supportive schools bill, which, um, you know, is the culmination of, I think, eight years of work with the governor's office. So we're hopeful that uh, it's moving to the Senate and will require that every teacher in the state of California undertake one hour of LGBT cultural competency training. Mm-hmm. Some of the things we were right. talking about before. Um, my first bill is AB3, which is really aimed at trying to advance offshore wind. I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to um, address our climate challenges and get off of dirty fossil fuels, and Diablo Canyon, we right. need offshore wind and we need to basically have a strategy in place to to make sure that that happens. And I don't think without more legislative intervention, that's likely to happen. Mm. Um, and we need to pr- protect the jobs for this. I mean, one of the really cool things about offshore wind is, you know, I remember when I came to California in the 1980s and we still had the aerospace industry, which is the outgrowth of what happened during right. World War II and the Korean War. And it was such a robust industry with so many high wage, high skill jobs, we can do the same thing with offshore wind as long as we make sure that the jobs come here to California. We need to be manufacturing these turbines here. We need to be assembling these turbines here. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs per year over a 20 year period. And that's one of the things that we can actually 
really provide and uplift Californians and provide environmental justice to Californians through something that's cleaning up the environment and making that a reality and bringing the environmental community and the labor unions together on something where they've got shared objectives. Right. Um, I've got uh, some, some bills that are uh, focused on housing, uh, one that actually helps foster youth um, that may become homeless, another one that um, uh, my housing, um, California Housing Security Act, which is now a two-year bill, uh, but it would provide, it's really focused on prevention. A lot of my bills on the housing and the homelessness space are really trying to focus on how do we prevent those 10,000 new homeless people right. that become unhoused every year from coming into the pipeline because we're more coming into the pipeline than we're taking off. And so we really need to focus on that piece of it. And so I've got a bill that provides rent subsidies for the people that are most highly um, housing insecure, uh, former veterans and uh, former foster youth, people that were unemployed, uh, low-income seniors, people living with disabilities, uh, up to $2,000 per month. The County of LA just came on as a sponsor. So we're trying to build support for that. Um, I've got one bill that's, that's focused on um, uh, uh, giving uh, uh, people with permanent physical disabilities who are living in rent-controlled apartments on the second floor the ability to sort of stay in a rent-controlled apartment when they become homebound and can't get out of their apartment because they don't have an elevator in the building. So yeah. it would allow them to move to first floor units, the comparable one without getting their rent reset. And we worked very hard on that, trying to working with both the housing advocates and the rent control advocates and the apartment owners about a bill that is actually fair to all of them. And I'm very excited about that one. And I've got a whole host of other bills <laughs> got, uh, as well. But, yeah. yeah. Well, awesome. Well, you're going to have an awesome year, 30 days. Thank you so much for, for coming, stopping by. Fascinating talking with you. Uh, yeah. Love to have you on again, but uh, I know you got to go and uh, get to work. So I'd love to thanks so much, Rick. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All I really right. appreciate it. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks.